Hey friends, welcome to episode 17 of the Teeth Time Podcast. This is a special episode for me because for whatever reason, my favorite number in the world is 17. So a special episode to me needed a special guest. And as I was perusing through Instagram, a D1's profile caught my eye. Bart Voto is a first year dental student at Harvard, which is obviously pretty cool. And we connected through Instagram. What immediately stood out to me about Bart was his thoughtful posts on Instagram about his dental school experiences, which I obviously greatly appreciate. And then also the fact that he was an NHSC scholar something that I really looked forward to talking about, considering the fact that I made a YouTube video not too long ago dedicated to the topic of paying for dental school. In this episode of Teeth Time, Bart and I talk about his pre-dental experiences, which are really great considering the fact that he picked dentistry early on and just stuck with it uh, through thick and thin. We talk specifics about how he studied for the DAT and how he made himself a great candidate and was accepted at Harvard. We also then talk a lot about the Harvard curriculum, which was really interesting for me because it's quite different from the curriculum that I have been experiencing in Tennessee. Bart talks about how important it is to him to serve others, and I really, really respect this, and I look forward to watching him go through his career as a dentist in the future. So hopefully you learned something from the discussion that I'm about to have with Bart. Sit back, relax, and enjoy it. It's teeth time. Bart, welcome to the Teeth Time Podcast. Thank you for being here today, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to have this opportunity to chat with you. Um, like I said, I'm a huge fan of all of your work and content, so super exciting to be here. Well, thank you, my friend. I'm honored, uh, and I'm super excited to have you. Uh, you are a first-year dental student at Harvard, which comes with a big name, obviously, as I'm, I'm sure you're pretty accustomed to now. So I'm excited about, uh, I'm really excited about hearing about your first year of dental school and just how everything's going, uh, what Harvard is like, and, and just adding to this this list of people that I'm able to talk to on this podcast to, to learn more about the dental world, about the dental education and everything that goes into that. So um, as I typically like to do, um, at the beginning of the podcast here, I, I like to have my guests introduce themselves and just kind of give a brief background on their, their personal history, their, their history with education, and just sort of how, how they got to, to where they are now. So why don't, you, why don't you let us know everything uh, about you? Yeah, of course. So my name's Bart. I um, grew up in Long Island, New York, and that's essentially where I've lived my entire life um, before going to college and then eventually starting dental school. So... Um, pretty much throughout my childhood, I've always been interested in the sciences. My father was uh, professionally trained as a chef, but he was an amateur astronomer. So growing up, we used to go outside and look through his telescopes and he would show me the planets and the constellations and that kind of piqued my interest in science. And going into high school, I still kind of had that itch to learn more about all the different types of sciences that were out there. And I participated in my high school's research program which um, was a really awesome experience because I was able to kind of get my hands dirty in a lot of research that high school students wouldn't normally have access to. Luckily, the, the public high school that I went to had great funding for these types of activities. So I was able to kind of benefit from that sort of thing. Um, then going into college, uh, I went to Hobart and William Smith Colleges, which was, a, it's a small liberal arts school in upstate New York. And pretty much through my four years there, I was a, a varsity athlete for all four years. I was on the rowing team and my role was a coxswain. So that's the guy who kind of sits at the back of the boat, steers and kind of tells the rowers what to do. And I did that through high school and was uh, recruited to do that in college. So that's pretty much how I occupied a lot of my time when I wasn't studying. Um, essentially, in terms of how I got to dental school, um, Along with my interest in science as a kid, I also had a really great relationship with my pediatric dentist. Um, I had a lot of cavities growing up. Essentially, every single one of my teeth has had work done on them, except for my two uh, front incisors, and essentially went to go see him a lot. And yeah, he kind of just made me feel comfortable being at the dentist, and he would try to explain to me what he was doing and would try to educate me. And that kind of got me interested in the profession. And I essentially just had a great relationship with him growing up and seeing him very often. 
So going into college, dentistry was kind of what I knew I wanted to do, but I didn't want to narrow myself down too much. So I kind of kept my eyes open to other options. I knew I wanted to major in something science related. Um, I was a biochemistry major. I'm not sure if I had mentioned that, um, but I was thinking possibly I might want to be a chemistry teacher or go into engineering of some sorts. But I kept coming back to this idea of becoming a dentist because I really saw myself working with people, working in the healthcare profession, and essentially kept coming back to this I, this relationship that I had with my pediatric dentist um, and kind of wanted to continue doing work like that for the rest of my life. So throughout college, I tried to get my hands wet with dental experiences such as shadowing, and I started doing that my freshman year. Um, and I'm sure we can talk more about the other yeah. experiences that I had later on. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's wonderful. First off, I, I, I was very happy to hear that you were a rower. My, when I was in high school, it seems like it was a long time ago. Now, all of my best friends were rowers. I was not a rower oh, myself. No I played lacrosse and hockey in high school, uh, which is pretty rare for a person in the South actually to play that combination of sports, but all of my friends were on the rowing team. So when she said, uh, you were a coxswain, I was like, yep, yeah, I, I remember all of that. Uh, but that's great. And, oh, that's um, also I, I love to hear that you, you had this sort of special relationship with it, with a dentist at a young age. I think that's most of the people that you talk to seem to have something like that, where it's not just that dentistry kind of came out of nowhere. It's that they had someone influential in their life that was able to kind of draw them to the profession in one way or another. Uh, for me, it was my dad. And I, and it's awesome to hear that for you, it was, it was your pediatric dentist. Uh, so we could get into that a little bit later as well. But uh, yeah, just, I think it's also interesting that you said you started it in your freshman year with your, with your experiences. For me, I kind of, it took me a few years to get it all figured out in college, but how was, what was that intro to your, dental experiences like? How did you go about finding things to do uh, to, to sort of get you on this right track to being accepted into dental school? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's really important to kind of keep in mind that everyone has their own unique path into dental school or medical school or whatever profession that you're going into. Um, I was really lucky in some regard that I had an older brother or I have an older brother who's currently a first year medical resident. So as I was in college, he was in medical school and had recently gone through the process of applying. And um, like some people know, the, the dental school and the medical school application process is quite similar. So he was having conversations with me and was like, you know, if you're really serious about going into dentistry, um, it would be a smart idea to start shadowing as soon as you can. It doesn't have to be any big commitment or anything serious, but just getting some clinical exposure and seeing the daily intricacies of what it's like to be like a healthcare professional would be a good idea early on um, in college. That way, if you find out that it's not for you, you can potentially change gears or find something else that interests you. So I think it started my freshman year over like my Thanksgiving and my winter break. I would just go into local dental offices. I would reach out beforehand and say, I'm a college student. I'm interested in going to dental school. I was wondering if you would uh, be willing to have me come in and shadow for a few hours on any particular day. And I was lucky to find a few places um, that would let me come in. That's awesome. And those experiences are, are very valuable, I think, in my opinion, because, and I've been talking about this recently on my channel, is just knowing if dentistry is for you is, is hard. And uh, I think the only you're never going to fully know i mean i you and i as dental students don't fully know what it's like to be a dentist we just we still don't have any real any real idea uh, the d4s still don't know because they're not dentists yet so it's like yeah. you get a better idea the further you get into it but especially in, in college when you're looking at it you have no real way of knowing and so those early shadowing experiences at least give you some sort of idea of what the day-to-day -day is like uh, you're standing in an operatory, you're kind of looking over someone's shoulder, you have absolutely no idea what they're doing, uh, and you can't really see anything either. But, uh, but, it's, but it's important to just kind of be there and, and to just start to, to learn it a little bit. Um, did you ever, once you decided, I guess you said around college and around this time, did you ever kind of wonder if it was, it was right for you? Because I think at times in undergrad, at least in my experience, there, there is that question of like, well, I don't know for a fact if I'm going to get in. So it feels like I'm doing all this work for for no guaranteed outcome. Uh, so did you ever have any sort of questions like that in your in your mind? 
Absolutely. Um, I honestly think that shadowing sometimes might not be enough for some people to convince them that this is the exact profession, because sometimes when you're shadowing, you're kind of just standing awkwardly in the corner. You might not even be able to see what's going on inside the patient's mouth, and you might not be able to ask questions. Um, So I think it's really important to kind of branch out and see what other types of opportunities you can get. So for me personally, shadowing wasn't enough. I wanted to see um, what else dentistry could offer and understand like how complex this profession really is. So I looked out for other opportunities throughout like my sophomore, my junior year. And the summer going into my sophomore year, I volunteered at this health clinic called Remote Area Medical which is a nonprofit organization, and it's pretty much offering um, free health, dental, and vision care to remote and rural underserved areas of the United States. And the way I found out about this program was that my brother had done it a few years prior when he was applying to medical school, and I made the trip down to um, like rural Virginia. It was specifically called Wise County, and um, I was there a few days before the clinic to help set it up and um, essentially worked as a dental assistant for the three days during the clinic. And I wasn't professionally trained or I didn't have any um, certificate that allowed me to be a dental assistant. However, I was kind of just able to learn from the dental providers that were volunteering at the clinic, some of the the ins and outs of assisting. And I was able to get that real hands-on experience, which I think was super vital um, in my decision to actually commit to dentistry Um, Not only because I thought the profession was cool that you get to work with your hands and you get to work with people, um, but that particular experience really motivated me to kind of make it a professional goal of myself to work in like rural and underserved areas and use the skills that I acquire as a, a dentist, as a healthcare professional and use those skills to benefit those who need it the most. Absolutely. so yeah. Yeah, and I, I had the same. It was the same thing for me. I think RAM, RAM. The benefits of RAM are not. They're not there to benefit young students. But I, I actually wonder if the, if the organizers of those RAM clinics realize how many students they impact every year because it really is. Many of those clinics are like you say in super rural areas. They need volunteers to to come help, and so a lot of times students are able to just kind of come in and, and get thrown into a situation where they're, they're they have actual like real responsibilities in a dental scenario and for me that was amazing I was like this is so cool uh, because I was assisting in extractions and it just was that kind of click moment for me as well so if and you're gonna have to travel most likely uh, to go to a RAM clinic but if you are a, a student I think I think Bart and I would both would both recommend a RAM clinic because it's a really important experience. Um, let's move forward a little bit. We got to talk about the DAT because it's something that every yeah. every pre dental student goes through. For me, it was the scariest part of of applying. Um, once I got through the DAT and did well on it, I kind of felt like everything was downhill from there. As far as like level of difficulty, that was the peak for me. So, uh, how did you kind of approach approach the DAT? Absolutely. Um, so I kind of knew that my trajectory into dental school. Um, was likely going to be that I would go straight through. So I graduate from college and that following semester, I would enroll in dental school um, since I was fortunate enough to kind of know that I was going to go be applying to dental school early on in my college process. So I took the DAT the spring semester of my junior year. And like you said, it was a very stressful time trying to figure out how how I was going to study for the exam, when I was going to schedule the exam, should I Um, wait until the summer going into my senior year to take it or should I take it earlier on Um, there was a lot of things you keep in mind when you're trying to plan out your studying for me personally I knew that I didn't want to study for the exam while I was actually in school because there were so many things I was busy with extracurriculars um, being an athlete as well as like the normal course load of being a pre-dental which as we know can be quite challenging some semesters So I kind of made the full commitment to use my winter break in between my first and second semester of junior year to study for the exam. So I believe it was five weeks of just pure crunch time. And 
essentially the weeks leading up to the exam, I not leading up to the exam, the weeks leading up to my study period over winter break, I was just trying to do as much research as I could, um, looking all over YouTube, seeing how other people studied for the exam, listening to podcasts like this, figuring out what resources people recommend. And I kind of just made a master document of what everyone was recommending and essentially tried to find patterns in what people were recommending and see which worked the best, uh, what materials and what resources worked the best for the most amount of people. So I essentially committed to using um, DT Bootcamp and other free online resources, just like YouTube videos that I found. I think I used um, this AP Biology Cliff Notes book that also was really helpful for the bio section and essentially just spent the first two and a half weeks of uh, dedicated that to content review. So going through all the content of the chemistry, the orgo section, reviewing a lot of the bio section and a lot of the material in the biology section, none of us really took in undergrad. So that was a lot of self-studying. Um, so I was trying to just make flashcards for the bio. And then essentially the second half of my study period was dedicated to taking practice ex exams and doing practice questions and not just understanding like the questions that I got wrong, but really understanding all of the individual answer choices and what each answer choice meant and kind of being able to tease apart every aspect of the question to make sure I fully understood the entire concept. And I think that helped me kind of achieve the success that I was looking for in the DAT. It wasn't just like a superficial, am I getting the question right or wrong? It was mostly understanding all the concepts that are involved and understanding what all the answer choices mean, because it can be a very daunting exam. So you want to make sure you are kind of covering all your bases there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's so true, especially for bio, I, I feel. Um, now, granted, it feels to me already in my life that the DAT was like eight years ago. It wasn't, but it feels like a long time ago. Um, so I, I even struggle at times to remember everything. But for me, bio was so I did, like I think boot camps full of bio notes was like five, six hundred pages, something like that. And so yeah. when you do go through those questions, it's invaluable that you look at every answer choice and you understand each each answer choice and what would be correct why the you know why this one is b and not c um because your test it's you you you've got 600 pages however many pages of material that they could ask about and you're going to get very specific questions so you're you're just broadening the uh the i guess the breadth of, of information that you're learning so that's super super important um and yeah Absolutely. i mean it's uh it's it's a nerve-wracking experience i think a lot of people dread it it was from like i said for me when i looked at the broad spectrum of, of applying to dental school the dat was just the one thing that i was like i'm not looking forward to that i've always considered myself someone who would do well in an interview and that turned out to be true um, the coursework was just day, day to day but the dat was like this it was a big deal and i also i studied for a part part of my studying was when i was in school and I ended up having to reschedule my DAT because we had a we had finals week in, in, in undergrad and that was supposed to be in my study period chunk of time. And I just couldn't do both. I remember on my finals week, I literally didn't touch any DAT materials. So I freaked out and I was like, I pushed my test back like 10 days or something because I was like, I need this extra time. Um, but I love how you said basically just you got organized early and you put together everything that you would need to do. Um, and that, that really is helpful. So it was, well, what about just before we move on, what about perceptual ability? Cause I think that's an interesting aspect of the DAT that people kind of don't really know how to approach. What did you kind of do for that? Yeah, the, the PAT section was probably the most challenging for me. Um, kind of a year before I took the exam, I kind of got familiar with what the exam involved and saw that there was this perceptual ability portion. I was like, what is that? And I was looking online, trying to get some more information about it. And I found that there were some online generators. There was an app on your phone you could download. So I kind of play, I started playing around with the PAT um, a few months before I started actually studying for the exam. But I think when I started actually studying, I got so caught up in the chemistry content, the bio content, that I almost pushed off studying for the PAT or for the reading comprehension section because I was just so stressed out about all of the material that I need to learn rather than the skills that I needed to practice. Um, so I think it's important to remember that each section of the DAT is weighted equally when it goes to your academic average. And 
I mean, the schools do whatever they do with the scores and might look at different sections differently. Um, but don't wait to the last two weeks of your DAT studying to start practicing the skills um, that are involved in that section because they are highly learnable. And there are a lot of strategies that are out there on the internet, on YouTube, that will essentially help you um, score higher in that section. So I would make sure to use your resources and use them early. Absolutely. Yeah, I always recommend start studying for the PAT aspect like as far in advance as possible because it's it's purely a skill. Uh, there is no like no knowledge behind it. I mean, there is a, a base level of knowledge of what the questions are asking and some of the things that you could do with it, but start early and just start learning how to do it. And then with reading, it's like, even just adding 10, 15 minutes of reading of any sort a day, which seems, I think on, on face value, that seems like it's not very much, but nowadays people don't really read as much anymore. I'm guilty of that myself. I, I've just recently started to read again. Um, but just sitting down and reading a good book, it doesn't have to be anything dentistry related or science related, just anything. Uh, you really build up, I guess you're, you're, you're reestablishing the synapses or something in your brain and it really helps. So um, let's Absolutely. let's jump forward again, and we'll we'll go to we'll go to acceptances. Uh, why why Harvard? Why was that the choice? Other than the fact that it's freaking Harvard. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, kind of going back to my experience working with Ram, um, I had a lot of conversations with the patients who were attending the clinic, and kind of just trying to get a better sense of who they were as people, what brought them to this clinic, and what were the circumstances that essentially brought them to RAM. And a lot of the common threads that I, were hear I was hearing was that there aren't medical professionals, there aren't dental professionals in many areas of the country, and a lot of people are denied the access to procedures that someone like you and I might see as routine or basic, like a filling or a cleaning. Um, for some people, those types of procedures are considered luxuries and people travel weeks, they wait online for however many hours or days for these sorts of clinics. And that really motivated me to not only become a dentist who is focused on the, the drilling and the filling, but I kind of wanted to become a dental health professional that understood the patient as a whole. How does the mouth relate to the body? How is the oral health connected to the systemic health? And going into the application cycle, I wanted to have a heavy emphasis on not only dental education, but medical education as well. And something that really attracted me to HSDM was the first year is fully integrated into the medical school. So unlike pretty much any program in the country, we aren't really taking any dental courses and we're not really, or frankly, we're not touching hand pieces or dental instruments at all. We're just doing whatever the, the medical stu school do students are doing that first year. So we're learning the skills such as um, interviewing patients, taking a full history, um, going into the hospitals and practicing interviewing real patients and learning how to empathize and learning how to collect information from all facets of life and having difficult yet necessary conversations with them. And we're also kind of learning the skills of physical examination, so doing the head-to-toe physical. And my hope was by learning all these skills that a lot of people might not think are necessary for dentists, is that when I go into these areas that are medically underserved, that are rural, um, I'll kind of be able to help bridge that gap between oral care and systemic care. Yeah, and it's so interesting to hear just the, the, the curriculum because I think my at my school at UT is probably pretty standard uh, as far as like what is done nationwide. First two years are, are didactics, second two are, are mostly clinical treating patients. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think as far as like uh, dentistry as a whole is generally a very physical thing. Like you're you're physically working on on teeth. Uh, you're building things, you're, you're creating something from nothing in a lot of cases. Uh, so there is a medicine aspect, of course, you're prescribing medication, you need to understand uh, systemic illnesses, you need to know all of this, but the actual, like what you're doing day to day is, is very physical. 
that being said, like you're going to learn it. Um, and you, you'll learn a lot of it in dental school, but like all of us, the majority of what we learn hands on wise is going to come after dental school. So the ability to start Absolutely. out, like you're saying, and get this foundation of just patient care in general, head to toe understanding. And, and a lot of it too is, is psychological and mental understanding where patients come from and, and what they're thinking, a lot of their, their fears and their anxieties and things, all of these things are important. And so I, I love that you sort of saw that as, as valuable and you pursued that. Um, and I also just love to hear about it because I didn't even know that about, I, I figured y'all's curriculum was slightly different. I just didn't know exactly, exactly what you were up to. So you do have a handpiece in your hand now, is that correct? Uh, so actually, I'm still in my first year, um, so I haven't touched any dental instrument nice. pretty much. So <laughs> I actually think the the D2s currently have just started practicing their hand skills. Okay. So um, from what I understand from most other dental schools, that's extremely late. Mm -hmm. But like you said, you essentially have your entire career to yeah. refine your hand skills. It's a lot of the like the social part of dentistry or medicine that you have to kind of have an early foundation with mm -hmm. um, that you can't necessarily pick up later on. Yeah. And I've, I mean, I've heard the opposite. Like I said, I think we're kind of in the middle. I've, I've heard that there are second year, like D2s at LSU who are already treating patients. Uh, we don't start doing that until this summer. My class will be once we go into D3 year. So it's, it's the curriculums vary. Um, but ultimately the objective is the same. The objective is to be right. a, a great practitioner and, uh, Absolutely. An, an honest practitioner, someone who cares, someone who takes care of their patients and takes care of their staffs. Uh, and so however you think you personally can get that education best is, is, is best is, and is, should be valuable to you. So I think I noticed by your Instagram bio that you are, you have a bit of a scholarship situation going on. Am I correct in that? Yeah. So okay. I'm currently with the, the National Health Service Corps Scholarship. Nice. Um, and yeah, the NHSC, it's essentially just a federally funded program that's offered by, I believe, the Health Resource and Service Administration. It's essentially a federally funded program for um, health care providers, whether that's a nurse practitioner or a physician or a dentist that want to work in medically underserved areas. Um, and essentially they will cover the cost of tuition and cover the cost of expenses, um, in return for a service requirement or commitment for up to four years after graduating to work in these, um, health professional shortage areas. And uh, that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm so happy that I, like I noticed that today it was in your Instagram bio and I'm so happy because you may know, but I recently made a video talking about the different ways you could pay for dental school, yeah. which is a huge topic and a very important one. Uh, the Absolutely. price of attendance is skyrocketing and people are, a lot of people are being deterred from dentistry just because of the, uh, the cost of a admission. Um, so it, it's per it seems perfect for you talking to you for like 30 minutes already. I could tell this was the perfect scholarship for you uh, because it, it's likely that even without that scholarship, you'd want to go into these same areas and, and do the same type of work. Um, so is it, and I don't know a whole lot about this, but it, when they, when they go to place you, can you tell them like, I would like to stay in the state or is it basically they're going to send you anywhere? Yeah. So I actually really appreciate that we're talking about this. Cause like you said, not a lot of information is available about mm -hmm. the scholarship up there, out there. So I kind of want to bring awareness to this. So other pre-dental sure. or pre-med students can kind of understand what the process is like and what the commitment might look like. So in terms of being placed after graduation, it's essentially up to the student. So they have people that help you find jobs, but you're essentially allowed to work wherever you want. It just has to be within the United States and it has to meet a certain um, grading of uh, like health professional saturation. So it just has to have, be in a or um, like a, a qualified site of some sort. So mm -hmm. that's either in community health centers or I'm sure there are private practices as well that are also mm -hmm. accredited. They just have to be in a more rural or underserved area. Yeah. Yeah. That, okay. That's fantastic. And it makes perfect sense as well. Um, because there are areas obviously that the, the closest dentist is 50, 60 miles away or something like that. Right. Um, so this, this is great. And I think this, 
I, I had I always have questions about the future. Um, I, t I tend to ask people. Some people get nervous. They're like, I don't want to think about the future. I'm just trying to go day to day, which is perfectly acceptable. Uh, most people go through their entire dental school experience and they figure out a little bit, but they don't figure out the whole big picture of their life. Uh, so this kind of places you already a little bit into your future. And I, I think you probably have somewhat of an idea of where you'll where you'll end up. Uh, yeah. So like you said, the future is a difficult topic to kind mm -hmm. of think about because so much can happen between now and then. Sure. But it is assuring that knowing after I graduate dental school, um, I will be able to kind of work for four years and I won't necessarily have to worry about um, the burden of student loans, which could be very heavy for dental students. Um, so the thing is with the National Health Service Corps is that it's for people who are interested in primary care. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really allow you the flexibility to go and specialize in, let's say, perio or endo. Essentially, you either fulfill your re scholarship requirement right after you graduate and practice as a general dentist, or I'm pretty sure you can go into pediatrics as well. So do your residency training and then fulfill your requirement afterwards. So I essentially have eight years, um, the next eight years at least, sort of mapped out in terms of what I'm gonna do. Um, afterwards, I'm trying to keep an open mind. It's possible that I work for four years and I'm content with just being a general dentist and becoming really good at a broad um, skill set. But currently right now I'm thinking that I might want to specialize and kind of for, uh, like widen my toolkit and the types of procedures that I can do. So I shadowed a few periodontists recently and over the past couple of years and thought that specialty was really awesome because it's very surgical, but there's a lot of opportunities for research mm -hmm. as well. Um, so it's possible that after I fulfill my scholarship obligation, I go back and specialize, but it's possible that after I finished those four years, I realized that I frankly don't want to go back to school. So I'm trying to just keep an open mind and see where the wind blows. And yeah. it's not for another eight years or so. It's honestly, I just sitting here talking about it. It sounds, it sounds great because yes, the student loan debt is outrageous. Uh, and, and we all are going to, most all of us are going to have to handle that at some point. Um, but like you say, it, I'm thinking about this. You have a, basically you have a four year trial run with dentistry in general kind of see like what you enjoy about it what you don't enjoy it granted it's your scenario might be a little different than others as far as what you're doing you might be doing a lot of uh, a lot of basic operative and, and a lot of extractions and things like that as opposed to some of the more advanced procedures or some of the more um, costly procedures like endo for example but you do have this trial period and if at the end of that period you're, you're like okay I, you know I, I would like to go ahead and specialize or, or try something a little bit more specific you don't have this crazy student loan debt. So you're able to kind of go in fresh and get that specialty, which is just awesome. And when it comes to, to residency programs, you'll, as you have probably already seen or will see meeting residents, they, a lot of them actually are like that where they go out and practice in, in, in general dentistry for a few years and then come back to specialize in something. It's very common. So you get residents that are of all sorts of ages. So, all of that is fantastic and yeah you're in your first year so there's plenty of time to think about it and figure it out and uh, i think once you get in and start using the hand piece and, and learning about the hands-on aspects of dentistry you'll you we all gravitate to, to certain things and and none of us are going to be able to do all of it so we, we we're better at some things than others uh, so tell me about about your first semester kind of some big takeaways that you had and what you learned what what went well what didn't go well maybe yeah um so i think Kind of the biggest takeaways, uh, I'm very fortunate in that at Harvard, it's a pass-fail curriculum. So there isn't a lot of stress in memorizing every little detail. Because um, quite frankly, a lot of the small, like the, the names of proteins and every step of biochemical pathways, yes, it's very un important to understand at a, a general broad level. However, the, the little micro details a few years from now aren't going to be as important unless you're going into a particular research field. Um, so given that, I think it's really important to kind of use this time while you're in dental school to 
figure out a little bit more who you are, especially for myself coming out of uh, undergrad, uh, kind of using these years to find a good um, social network, n really rely kind of on your family and find the people that you love and keep them close to you because dental school can be a very isolating experience and you want to make sure that you're just solidifying those relationships um, and not getting too caught up in the schoolwork because it can be very consuming. Um, so you want to make sure you're staying connected to the people that you love, growing relationships with other people that are in your class, that are in your community, um, and just making sure that you yourself are happy and healthy because school can be a very stressful time. Yep, absolutely. And I agree with every point there. Um, you know, I, I live alone here, so there's plenty of plenty of opportunities to, for me to feel isolated. Thankfully, I do have a great support system. I, I'm able to call my parents all the time, per perhaps more than a 25 year old should. Uh, but and I also have my girlfriend who I love dearly back home. So I with COVID, too, I'm able to get home a lot. So it's it's been good. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, establishing a good support system and trying to keep yourself grounded is, is very important. Um, I kind of, the way I look at it is, at least to me, dental school hasn't, from a school perspective, hasn't felt all that different than undergrad was. I don't think it's markedly more difficult. Perhaps there's more material, but uh, it's really just more school. The only difference that, that I've noticed is the lab stuff, which is a completely new thing that, you know, you're going to take chemistry labs in, in college. You're going to pipette things and do titrations and stuff, but you're not going to, you're not going to cut a crown prep in college. So it's a completely new scenario, but it's really a, a wonderful one. So, uh, what are y'all, what are y'all working on right now in your second semester? Yeah. So currently we're in this block called essentials to the profession, and it's a four week long block where we kind of step back from the, the hard sciences and physiology and anatomy. And we look at um, broader scale things that relate to human health. So right now we're talking a lot about social medicine, so social determinants of health, racism, and kind of institutional wide um, issues. We're learning a little bit about epidemiology, um, talking about ethics, and um, kind of just taking these four weeks to get a better understanding of what it means to be a healthcare professional and some of the um, barriers that are like in place in our current society that deny people the fundamental right to healthcare. So that's kind of what we're doing right now. And it's been a nice break from the hardcore sciences and a good way to kind of ease us back into the school mode, being on winter break for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's currently what we're working on. And right after we finish this block, that's when we're gonna get into um, pretty much physiology and learning all of the different organ systems and um, a lot of the pathology related to each organ system. And that's kind of going to go from February through the summer. Nice. And yep, it's a very unique curriculum, but I like it. It sounds great. Uh, so good deal. Well, tell me a little bit about, because I obviously found you on Instagram. Tell me a little bit about your, your dental Instagram, kind of why why, and, and where you hope to see that, that go. Yeah, so <laughs> I think the whole dental community that I guess started on YouTube. Um, I think starting in high school, I began watching, I think Brittany goes to dental school. She was creating vlogs of her daily life as a dental student. And you don't really see a lot of that out there. Um, so kind of going through college, I was following other dental YouTubers or dental influencers to kind of get a better understanding of what it's like to be a dental student or what the application process looks like. And that's where I got, honestly, a lot of, I call it mentorship because a lot of these people are putting themselves out there and making these pages or posting these videos to help um, pre-dentals go through a process that's very challenging, that there's not a lot of information available for it. So I kind of wanted to um, become part of that community as well and kind of pay that back because it really was influential um, in me getting to where I am now. And I'm very thankful to have had um, the like mentorship and the lessons that I've taken away from YouTubers like yourself. Um, and yeah, I just think it's an awesome community to be part of and I'm happy to share my experiences and 
um, yeah, kind of get to have these kinds of conversations with other dental students. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, you're so right because we have the internet's good and bad, but we do have the ability to create a network of people that can help the next generation, if that makes sense. And so um, I kind of felt the same way. I, I, I wanted a little bit more um, in terms of when I was an undergrad in terms of like YouTube dentistry and on YouTube. I just I did I wanted a little bit I wanted to see more I, I didn't really understood uh, understand what the labs looked like and, and what the classes that we would take looked like and every time I did see a video I was super enthralled I was like this is so cool this is actually what dental school is like and um, so I've enjoyed kind of putting things out there and, and doing all of this because I'm starting to see younger students who are really benefiting from it and I think that's a great thing um, so props to you for doing it because I also understand that there's a lot of at, le at least for me like I, I still to this day have um, the things that kind of tug me back a little bit I, I don't I, I don't like to be someone who's drawing attention to myself necessarily I, I don't want to do it for attention or for notoriety or anything um, my objective was always to genuinely try to help younger students and I think at, in the beginning I fell victim not victim but i kind of sort of fell into that idea of presenting myself as this perfect student and now i'm like this that i can't do that anymore i have to be honest and transparent because that's what's actually going to benefit younger students but props to you for doing it um and uh i hope i hope to see you continue on with that for as long as you possibly can into your career thank you yeah it's been a good time and um uh, again, like I really love the community that's out there and kind of being able to inspire the next generation of dentists or dental students is a great thing. Sweet. Well, uh, you might know the, the last question that I always ask, and that is, uh, what is what is the one piece of advice that you could give to a pre-dental student? Your, your number one piece of advice, your best advice, uh, go. <laughs> yeah, I, I live by this. Don't spread yourself too thin in undergrad. A lot of people want to think that they need to be involved in everything, but honestly, do the things that make you happy um, because that's going to help you sustain your energy and your motivation for the long term. Um, don't do anything for the sake of having it look good on your resume or your application. Just do things that you're passionate about. Do things that genuinely excite you. Um, because essentially that's going to be what you're going to want to put your energy into and that's where you're going to make the most difference. Um, so that's something I tell to everyone and um, it's something that I tried to stick by when I was an undergrad and yeah. Good. That's perfect. Yeah, and it's, uh, man, I miss undergrad. I think we all do uh, because it's a lot more of a, it's a lot more of a free time, I think, of your life. You have more time in, in, in a certain sense and everyone around you is like free and, and generally speaking pretty happy um dental school you you get a lot of a lot of grind periods so enjoy it try to make the most of it and yeah try to try to like learn from the experiences you're having and allow them to form you in the right ways um it's great stuff it's good stuff so how can people people kind of find you connect with you and, and maybe ask you some questions because undoubtedly there are questions out there to be asked Absolutely. So like we had mentioned earlier, you could reach out to me on Instagram, student dentist underscore Bart. Um, I check my DMs and we'll try to respond as quickly as I can. Sorry if I don't get back right away. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty open to having conversations with people, um, answering any questions they might have about the application process or about Harvard Dental or the National Health Service Corps. So I'd love to talk to you guys. Um, and that's why I started this page. So please don't be afraid to reach out. Love to hear from some of you. Awesome. Well, Bart, thank you, my friend, for coming on and talking to me. And uh, just, I mean, you really do seem like you're a genuine person who's who's trying to help and trying to kind of, like you say, pay it forward to the next generation of, of, of students. So thank you for, honestly, thank you for doing what you're doing. And I look forward to following your career because I think you've got a lot, a lot of cool things that are going to come to you in the future. And, uh, and I look forward to, to watching all that happen. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. Again, I really appreciate you for bringing me on here and having this conversation with you. It's been a lot of fun. Absolutely, man. We'll have to do it again. All right, yeah. <laughs> all right, buddy. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for chatting, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. All right. All right, have a good one, man.
Thank you for listening to the Teeth Time podcast. I hope this conversation was at least somewhat enjoyable for you. Remember to check out my YouTube channel, that's Stephen P. Ray on YouTube, where you'll find plenty of visual content about the life of a dental student and creator. Also check out my Instagram at stephen.p.ray.dentistry. Long name, I know. I appreciate each and every one of you. This has been Teeth Time, and I'm out.